Bruce, thank you very much. Um, sorry, we didn't, we can't transpose weather. It would have been nice to have a nice rainy, blustery day today and all that sunshine yesterday. We were, we had nothing else to do. Um, as Bruce said, I'm very fond of Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and since my life has been framed by it, I heard a lot about it when I was growing up on Long Island. Uh, my first exposure to a scientific meeting of any seriousness where I actually made a presentation was here at the Lac Operon meeting in 1969. Um, and uh, I've been coming here. In fact, it's been the focus of much of my um, anxiety about meetings because <laughs> I've been coming to uh, meetings on RNA tumor viruses and cancer genes and, and, and symposia. Uh, ever since, and with great admiration for many things that go on here. I've published with the Cold Spring Harbor Press numerous times, and uh, like many in the scientific community, I'm very grateful for the organizational powers that it uh, offers for, with respect to publication, meetings, training, and many other things. Um, so what I'm going to do today is first open with some slightly formal remarks to let you know the mindset from which I'm going to be delivering these remarks. They have to do with some aspects of the introduction that Bruce just provided. Then I'd like to show you some slides about the big themes I'd like to present, and then I'm hoping that we have time for some informal Q&A afterwards, and certainly at the reception with a glass of something in our hands. So as you've just heard, um, about six months ago, I left the NCI, part of the NIH, uh, to work in a new lab at a medical school. And that's just what I did 45 years ago uh, in 1970 when I left a two-year training program uh, at the NIH during the Vietnam War um, to start work uh, with Mike Bishop at the medical school in San Francisco at UCSF. Now, first of all, I'm not under any illusions uh, that uh, these situations are actually identical. Uh, I don't think I have 45 years or more of scientific life ahead of me. Uh, at least not as an active investigator. Uh, I am no longer a virtually unknown physician trying to establish a career in science. Uh, my title in my new job in New York is not fellow or instructor or even assistant professor. I sit in an endowed chair that's emblazoned with the name of a forebear I respect very uh, greatly, Lewis Thomas. But there are still some important parallels. And those similarities give me a perspective on the landscape of medical science generally and cancer research specifically and how uh, the, the environment has changed over 45 years. What do we know now? What do we know 45 years ago? What, we, what were we poised to learn 45 years ago? What are we poised to learn now? How well does the support system for science work now and how well did it work then? And as a result of deficiencies in the support system, what is the mood of the scientific community today? I will address some of those things along the way, but there's some more things to think about. Then and now, uh, I had to decide what questions I'm gonna ask in my research program, and I need to build a laboratory team. Now, as then, I need to identify sources of financial support for my work and compete for those resources. Now, there are probably a few of you in the audience who think, why does this guy, who's been in the game for 45 years, uh, won a Nobel Prize, why does he have to worry about this kind of thing, supporting his research? But when I rejoined the NIH intramural program in, 19, in 2010, I had to give up my NIH grants, uh, and I returned to academia now uh, supported initially only with the kind of startup package that a new assistant professor might have. And that package uh, is built on the assumption that pretty soon I'll start winning federal grants and bringing money uh, into uh, Cornell Medical School. Uh, these days, as you're going to hear in more detail later, it's not that unusual for someone of my admittedly advanced age uh, to uh, apply for and actually get federal grants. Um, but now that kind of award comes at a greater price, namely one less award that's available to some talented younger person who's just starting out at an extremely competitive time that I will talk about near the end of, the, of my remarks. Now, as in 1970, I need to consider some practical things, how I'm going to keep up with the work of others, 
how I'm going to promulgate my own work, uh, how I'm going to guide my trainees to success successful careers, and the ways in which those things happen have also changed as a result of the internet, as a result of the successes of biomedical science that, are, that allows the kind of work we do to be important in many different kinds of careers. So in other words, in many ways, um, I'm affected by the state of our enterprise, by the scientific progress that's been made in the past, uh, by the social, political, and economic attributes of the country and of our field. And this has encouraged me to look during the course of this lecture um, at uh, many comparisons, some encouraging, some discouraging, uh, between the present and the world I entered in 1970. So I'm going to begin by saying something about the state of our art. And by our art, I mean our science, uh, and uh, try to give you some sense of where we are as a cancer research community. And a good place to begin is with a case, with a, with a patient. Um, so uh, here's an example of the kinds of things that are now possible and the ways in which the science we do and the clinical care we provide to patients are coming together. So the patient I'm going to tell you a little bit about is a 10-year-old boy uh, who developed a very um, aggressive uh, leukemia called a B-cell leukemia, leukemia arising from one arm of the, the, the uh, immune system uh, that uh, was treated with conventional chemotherapy that in many cases uh, can be curative, uh, but even after 30 days of this intensive chemotherapy, he still had uh, enormous numbers of, of uh, leukemic cells in his bone marrow and his blood. Uh, when his chromosomes were examined, it was clear uh, that there was a slight abnormality detectable only with high quality examination of his chrom chromosomes on chromosome, uh, on the long, so-called long arm of chromosome five. And a molecular analysis of that chromosome made possible by what we know about the human genome allowed uh, his doctors to detect that he had an abnormality of a protein that sits in the surface of cells called a platelet-derived uh, growth factor receptor, which has an enzymatic activity against which we have drugs. And that, that abnormality of his chromosomes led to the generation of an abnormal protein, which had an accentuated enzymatic activity for which there was a drug, a drug called Gleevec, that many of you may have heard about in a very different context of an adult uh, chronic leukemia. Uh, he was, despite his previous resistance to conventional chemotherapy when he was started on, on the drug Gleevec, or imatinib, uh, he went, underwent a, rem a remarkable, in fact, a complete uh, rem um, remission. Uh, and he remains in remission after two years. And that's been documented by looking at his bone marrow, as you can see down here, before uh, treatment full of what we call blast leukemic cells. Uh, after treatment with imatinib, the marrow looks essentially normal. Uh, an, ab an abnormal um, piece of DNA observed on a, on a, in a gel examination was present um, before, uh, well, during, at the time of diagnosis, you can see in the upper panel, uh, when treated with the drug, that disappears, and a uh, young man whose name is Harrison uh, is seen here with uh, his oncologist. Uh, my oncologist is a homeboy, is what it says on his, uh, on his shirt, and Harrison remains in good health up to this point. So at this point, um, and what this case illustrates is how much science goes into uh, the correct diagnosis and the proper, in this case, happily effective treatment of this young fellow. And to me, it's a starting off point for trying to figure out how we got there. How did we get to know so much? Uh, and uh, uh, how did um, our sense of the possibilities of cancer research 45 years ago uh, end up leading us to this point? A long course um, always seems shorter in retrospect than it does if you think about the future. Um, but uh, this is a time for us to, to reflect on what had to happen for this to, to, to be a reality. So in 1970, when I made that trip from Bethesda to California to start working on cancer research, one of the big questions in our field, and certainly the biggest question in my head, was a pretty simple, straightforward one. That is, how does a normal cell that behaves itself and, and constitutes 
a part of one of our normal organs become converted into a cancer cell? Uh, what are the events that, that change the nature of that cell? And we as a community had a lot of clues. We knew by then that smoking was likely to produce lung cancer. We knew that doctors exposed to radiation might get leukemia. We knew there were some chemicals that, that appeared to cause cancers in animals. Those chemicals were frequently chemicals that caused mutations uh, that were to be assessed by a functional change. Uh, we knew that there were families in which cancer occurred with high frequency. Uh, we knew there were viruses that could cause cancer in animals, uh, chickens, mice, rats, and others. Uh, we knew that sometimes when you looked at a cancer cell, you saw some funny looking chromosomes. Uh, and we knew that cancer was a pretty stable property of cells. That is, it wasn't, cancer was not like a disease that comes and goes. If you, if you, get, if you survive uh, a brief episode of the disease, it goes away. Cancer is a pretty persistent disease, and although there are rare reports of spontaneous remissions, they're very uncommon. So is there some common theme to all of this? And without taking you through the possibilities, one that loomed pretty large in the imaginations of most of us was the idea that cancer might be a disease in which mutations occur and change the behavior of a cell. And that raised the question of where those mutant genes came from. Were they delivered to cells in the form of viruses? Uh, were they always inherited? What were the genes? And indeed, if to make the question in 1970 a little more refined, uh, one of the things that we were all obsessed with is the notion, well, if cancer does arise from altered genes, what are those genes? You really can't think very concretely about this problem without knowing something about the genes we're talking about. Now, I know that students growing up today in biology have a hard time uh, thinking about this problem in the, in the right way because they think, just go ahead and sequence the genome and or clone all the genes in the genome, you can figure this out. But none of those methodologies were, uh, were available at that time. We knew that, that, uh, that um, there must be a lot of DNA in a human cell. There were probably tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of genes. How are you possibly going to identify which of those were the culprits if you thought that mutations were important? Well, there really was only there were only very few avenues available, and the most attractive to some of us was the idea of using the several kinds of animal viruses that could cause cancer in animals. Now, Cold Spring Harbor was then, still is, a focal point for research on those viruses. Uh, those viruses can come in two different general forms, carrying their few genes as DNA or carrying their few genes as RNA. And um, while both forms of virus proved to be important for varieties of reasons, um, from my own perspective, the, the viruses that carry their genes as RNA proved to be more interesting. And that's the, that there's only one major class of such viruses called retroviruses, and that's where uh, I actually focused my attention. Um, in part because there were some very useful tools available uh, to people working on animal viruses, including uh, the RNA tumor viruses. And those included assays conducted in animals, or even better, on a tissue culture dish where you could count the events. Um, a couple of kinds of traditional genetics. I'll show you what those are in a moment. This is not genomics, sequencing DNA. It's genetics, identifying functions of genes by looking at changes in cell behavior after you um, uh, mutagenize a cell. And then we had a few molecular methods. You could measure the size of a molecule. You could look at uh, some of its properties, whether one molecule was related to another by learning how to so-called hybridize the molecules. So give you some sense of what that meant. In 1910, a young physician at the Rockefeller Institute had isolated a virus from a sick chicken, a chicken with a big sarcoma tumor on its chest, and showed that there was a particle, probably a virus particle, that could pass through a filter and cause uh, another cancer in another chicken. And that virus, called Rouse sarcoma virus, uh, was the mainstay of work by many, in including me and my colleagues. Uh, and although difficult to work with 
with chickens and laborious and expensive and slow. Um, Howard Temin, a great hero of our field, uh, developed in the late 1950s a way to, uh, to test for the cancer-causing property of the virus um, in a cell culture and allowing uh, a sort of quantitative assay that also showed, as you can see here, a dramatic behavioral change in the cells. So that pile of cells comes from a single infected cell that presumably acquired some genetic trait when the virus infected it. So here we have an example of a viral cancer gene, we'll call it a viral oncogene, uh, transforming the, the behavior of cells and allowing us to say one particle, one infectious particle caused one locus of, of abnormal cells. So these were important tools that allowed the development of some genetic tests for how this virus might do what it does. And I mentioned two of those. Uh, one was the development of a so-called temperature-sensitive mutant of Rouse sarcoma virus, work done uh, exactly 45 years ago by Steve Martin, who's uh, uh, now a dean at Berkeley and was then a postdoc at Berkeley, uh, who uh, showed that the, he could I isolate, after mutagenizing a Rouse sarcoma virus, an isolate of the virus that would transform a cell at the low temperature, 35 degrees, but not the high temperature. Moreover, if you took a transformed cell and raised the temperature, it would go back to a normal appearance and vice versa, suggesting that you need not only a gene that was mutated in this experiment, but a gene that had to be functional continuously to maintain the cell in a transformed or cancer-like condition. So this was very important. It said that viruses cause cancer by introducing at least one gene, maybe more, but at least one, uh, and that gene needs to be active continuously after the infection to maintain the state. This helped develop a map of, a, of the very simple um, chromosome of the virus, and that map was helped enormously by the isolation of other kinds of mutants of the virus, so-called deletion mutants that have lost part of the information present on the right-hand side of this RNA molecule that serves as the chromosome of the virus. This allowed a new way of thinking about the virus that it seemed to have at least one cancer-causing gene that we call the viral SARC gene near, the, near, near one end of the genome. And by having deletion mutants, you could think about subtracting uh, uh, pieces of, of uh, nucleic acid that map to that region and using those as molecular detectors and to try to find out where that gene might come from. And without, uh, and without belaboring the story and making a fairly long story short, what that allowed us to do was to say that the viral oncogene at the bottom of the slide, VSARC, was derived from a normal cellular gene, has all the attributes that we now, uh, we now recognize in cellular genes, a gene that we call CSARC, which is um, a little different in its nature. It's not a cancer gene in its nature, natural state. It helps to, uh, for the, the organism to develop in many um, important ways. Um, but that gene can undergo a variety of changes that allow it to behave like a cancer-causing gene, as it does when it appears in Rouse sarcoma virus. In other words, there is a normal gene, which we call a proto-oncogene, that um, was presumably captured at some point in, its, in the history of the development of Rouse sarcoma virus to provide a, a cancer-causing function to that virus. Now, these findings were discussed in many places with great passion, especially at the RNA tumor virus meeting here at Cold Spring Harbor. And many other groups were working with retroviruses that cause cancer in a variety of animals. And many of those folks then found that the, the viruses they were working with had also acquired a slightly altered form of a normal cellular gene. So here are many of my colleagues. There are me and Mike on the left, and David Baltimore, and Ed Skolnick, and Bob Weinberg, and many other uh, Inder Verma, and many other heroes of this field, um, uh, with um, the names of genes that they had identified uh, in the same way that we had, we had identified uh, the, the SARC gene. And in each case, those proto-oncogenes um, had some important 
normal function in normal, the normal life of an organism, but in each case, the, uh, uh, the, the gene could be altered in some way or other to make it an active cancer-causing gene when carried by a virus. Now, that meant these were candidates to be genes that might be involved in the origins of human cancer. And indeed, many of these genes, um, including the ones I've noted in, in red, uh, are, have been shown over the years to be mutated in a variety of ways in the generation of human cancers, becoming targets for new kinds of therapies, uh, uh, ways to diagnose cancers in a more systematic way that's based on the actual genetic damage in each cancer, and not simply on the, the, the appearance of the cancer under a microscope. And this fed our imagination about how many genes might be candidates for the kinds of mutations that we imagined in 1970 might be uh, instrumental in the causation of human cancers. So that was nice, but we clearly needed a faster way to proceed. This work occurred over a decade or more. Um, it, it required that there be genetic information present in the virus that caused cancer, and elaborate and somewhat clumsy experiments required to identify the cellular progenitor, the proto-oncogenes. And the notion that we might be able to proceed more quickly uh, first was enunciated by um, the great uh, tumor virologist, uh, Renato Del Becco, uh, himself a Nobel laureate for work on the DNA tumor viruses, uh, who proposed in about 1985 that if we only could sequence human genomes, something that wasn't possible at that point, maybe we could completely transform the way we do cancer research by comparing the normal genome of an individual with the genome present in that person's cancer. And by that means, uh, making that comparison, identifying the genes that, are, that have undergone mutation to generate the cancer. Not so simple, and thinking about the complexity of the human genome with three billion base pairs, uh, a daunting proposition, and one that uh, incited a lot of conversation, a lot of hostility from some quarters, uh, and skepticism in others. Uh, but over the course of the next some years, as technology for, for mapping DNA, sequencing it more efficiently came into being, and the Genome Project, headed initially by Jim Watson and uh, later by Francis Collins, uh, began to go into high gear uh, by the year 2000 or 2003, depending on what you think the, the real endpoint was, uh, it was possible to put together a human genome and say this is at least one version of the human genome. We all differ by um, roughly 0.1 percent, but still a scaffold on which to think about the human genome and the development of better and better techniques for se sequencing more rapidly, more cheaply, and so forth. And as those techniques became more polished, swifter, cheaper, uh, those of us who were involved in the Cancer Institute began to think about how to develop a, an atlas of cancer genomes uh, using initially uh, three pilots with three common and difficult tumors. Uh, but ultimately extending this exercise to roughly 30 different types of cancer and working with the Human Genome Research Institute. Um, and then uh, using a large number of technologies that I won't spell out that allow a deep evaluation of human, the human genome and, and the RNA and protein that are made from the genome. Uh, and then by assembling some tremendous teams of people to analyze the tissues, to, the, to generate the sequence, to analyze the sequence, to coordinate the data and interpret the data, it was possible to, um, uh, to uh, provide a detailed analysis of many, many different tumor types. And let me tell you something about what's been learned. The basic thing we've learned is just how complex cancers are. There are some commonalities, but in general, not only is every kind of cancer different from every other kind, not as though we have one disease to deal with, we have hundreds of kinds, but even individual examples of each cancer are different. And here is the most complicated piece of data that I'll show you today, uh, just by way of uh, illustration of what I mean by complexity. Uh, this is an analysis of 
of a few hundred um, adenocarcinomas of the lung, a very the most common form of lung cancer in this country. Lung cancer is the major killer uh, by cancer in, in this country, indeed throughout the world. And what this shows you across the top are a series of, of tumors uh, listed um, on, the, on the up and down the vertical axis uh, are a number of genes, um, some of them known, some of them still mysteries, uh, and the, the little um, vertical dashes uh, and the different colors uh, indicate the kinds of mutations that affect each of those genes in different tumors. And your first response is going to be, is, you know, what a mess this is. Every tumor is different. And yes, that's true. Every tumor is different. Yet there are some genes that are mutated in as much as 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the tumors, telling you there are some commonalities. There are some uh, genes that occur together as mutants. There are other mutations that never occur together, and all of those are significant. Uh, moreover, if you begin to look at a very large connection from a different point of view to ask which is the most important of these mutations, you begin to see that, that uh, at least in about three quarters of the cancers, uh, we can say this mutation in a gene we know something about uh, is probably the most important driver of that cancer. And what's even more exciting and more important because it connects to what we actually do for cancer patients today, we now have drugs that are either in under testing or in many of these cases already approved by the FDA that can attack the cancers that have mutations in these driver genes. So you can see that taking a single kind of lung cancer and subjecting many different samples of it to this kind of detailed so-called high throughput analysis, you begin to identify the actual genetic culprits and that's a guide to developing uh, better therapies for this disease. And while there are important genes like the one on the lower right, the KRAS gene, for which we don't yet have good therapies, for many of the others, we do have therapies that, while not curative, uh, will put people into remissions and uh, for significant periods of time. Now, the complexity of the picture of a cancer genome is not just one that appears at a single, uh, at, at throughout the course of the, of the disease. Indeed, cancers are not just like a living organism, they're like an evolving set of, of individuals in an organism. And they, the tumors undergo an evolutionary process as they grow with new mutations occurring, different selective pressures being applied so that uh, subclones of the tumor uh, tend to emerge. This is, uh, we don't need to think about the names here, but, but uh, recently uh, several groups around the country have been looking at uh, um, pieces of tumor taken from individuals at different times or in different places, even different parts of a primary tumor, but especially uh, different metastatic growths of a tumor, and have been able to show that tumors are evolving, that, uh, that mutations found in the earliest cell in the tumor acquire, uh, are, are accompanied ultimately by other mutations, giving rise to a branching pattern uh, that uh, um, may be selected for growth in a certain place, a rapid growth rate, um, escape from uh, the effects of a drug. And this whole picture looks very similar to what Darwin wrote, uh, drew in his diary 150 years ago when he began to look at the evolution of species. So, Cancers are evolving entities uh, undergoing mutations at more or less at random with selection for properties that favor the continued growth of one of the cells or the cells that acquire additional mutations that make the cancers more vigorous. So given what I've had to tell you about how we've gone from a state of virtual ignorance about how cancer arises learning what genes are the most important in giving rise to a cancer, the kinds of mutations, the combinations of mutations. What happens next in, in this field? And very briefly, I'm going to give you a brief survey of what I think are some of the big problems. These are the things that I think about as I'm setting up my new lab at Weill Cornell Medical College. Um, one thing is a lot more genomics. Indeed, uh, this is something that was an obsession for me when I was the director of the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and um, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. 
The second thing is tumor immunology. And the third thing are other aspects of cancer behavior. Let me say a few things about each of these three. So first, more genomics, and not just genomics, not just looking at actual structural changes in DNA, but we call epigenomics, changes that don't um, change the genome in, in a way that's inherited, but changes that affect whether any individual genes will be expressed or not expressed. And those are changes that might affect, that, that might be chemical changes in the DNA that don't change the DNA structure, or they might be changes in the proteins that coat the DNA and determine which genes are read out and which are not. But as we think about this problem, we know that we have to go quite deep in our analysis of, of every cancer, looking at large numbers of tumors and many different individuals, uh, and th that will be a way to um, learn more about the genes that are affected by the mutations that drive cancer, and it'll lead to better and more targeted drugs. One of the biggest problems we've had with targeted therapy based on genomics is drug resistance, but studying the way in which tumors evolve and change um, is a way to learn about the rules that govern resistance to drugs and to overcome it. Uh, learning more about cancer genomes and comparing those results with the clinical outcomes is a way to predict uh, cancer risk and cancer outcomes um, by learning <coughs> how the products of mutant genes work in a cell. Uh, we can learn uh, what pathways that transmit a signal within a cell uh, might, be, uh, might be important um, in um, uh, thinking about how to interfere with, with uh, cancerous behavior of a cell. Ultimately, as we did with the treatment of HIV infections, we're gonna be using combination therapies to overcome drug resistance. That will emerge from uh, additional attention to genomics, and, um, and uh, uh, we need to assemble all this data into the large databases that are now possible thanks to uh, sophisticated computer science uh, in cloud computing, for example, and build a, a data commons to which all scientists will have appropriate access. Now, these are ideas that have come not just from uh, the, the minds of NCI directors, but also from the scientific community. And some years ago, about four years ago, the National Research Council put together a report called uh, Toward Precision Medicine, in which the notions that I'm describing here were uh, synthesized into a, a, a flow diagram in which um, a network of knowledge is developed, as shown in the lower left corner, uh, changing the way we <laughs> classify disease, creating a new taxonomy, improving diagnosis, allowing more targeted treatments, and presumably health, uh, better health outcomes. Uh, and that information, again, put into the knowledge network, accompanied by the kind of biomedical research done through the Cancer Genome Atlas and other projects, uh, and that information made available because we depend on patient populations to exercise a kind of altruism here based on the notion that everybody with cancer is potentially a cancer information donor. And permission to use that kind of information after generating it and putting it into this kind of knowledge network is going to be an essential tool nationally and globally if we're really gonna to come to grips with this disease and all of its complexity. Sorry, so the, this notion of precision medicine has been embraced by our president uh, and last July uh, he added a, um, a piece on precision medicine to his appropriation bill proposed, uh, sent to the Congress. Uh, that bill, as you probably know, has not been enacted. Uh, indeed, all we have for the fiscal year, which began three days ago, is a so-called continuing resolution. Uh, we don't know whether the precision medicine will be part of, a, of a, an appropriation bill we hope will em emerge from Congress sometime during the fiscal year. But what the president proposed was using about one-third of this initiative to study some of the aspects of cancer that I've been outlining. The second topic is immunology. Some of you who have followed this field over the last several decades may know that uh, there, has, there was a wave of enthusiasm for using the immune system to combat cancer that began at the beginning of the previous century, around 1900, with the discovery of 
what were called Cooley's toxins. But over the years, that enthusiasm has waned, in part because of a lot of failures of efforts to use the immune system to protect against cancer. But a number of things have allowed immunotherapy to come of age. Uh, first, the development of antibodies, so-called monoclonal antibodies, that attack proteins that are often present on the surface of, of cancer cells. Many of you may be familiar with Herceptin, which has been used to treat breast cancer for now a couple of decades. But there are others as well, like Atoxan and a few others. Some folks, including my former mentor from 40-some years ago at the NCI, has recently developed antibodies that have a toxic element to them. So they're used to target cancer cells and destroy them, and he's had some great successes with cancers that are uh, refractory to conventional therapy. Recently, it's been possible to use genetic engineering methods to make one branch of the immune system, so-called T cells, uh, able to recognize uh, proteins on the surface of cancer cells and to attack them. And most encouragingly and most dramatically, a uh, number of investigators uh, led mainly by, uh, by Jim Allison, who recently won a Lasker Prize that, uh, uh, that Bruce and I had a role in, in, uh, in, in deciding this year. Uh, for his understanding of the yin and the yang of the immune system, that the immune system has both positive forces and negative forces, and if you can relieve the, the negative force, un, uh, undo the brakes, block the brakes, uh, uh, and uh, that, that you can then uh, activate the immune system to attack uh, cancer cells. And indeed, uh, this approach of so-called checkpoint blockade or checkpoint inhibitors uh, has had a dramatic effect uh, on our thinking about cancer just in the last, in the last couple of months. Um, one of the exciting things is this is a very broad effort. Uh, it began with, <coughs> with studies of uh, a cancer of the skin called melanoma that has always been of special interest to immunologists. Uh, and indeed, now, by using a combination of breakpoint inhibitors, uh, we, we can induce remissions in uh, two-thirds of uh, patients with uh, widespread melanoma. Uh, there have been similar successes with leukemias and more recently with renal cancer and bladder cancer and lung cancer and others. Um, there is presumably some precision to all this, too. We don't understand the rules yet, but it's very likely that the, the cells are making foreign proteins that are recognized by the immune system, and the immune system will act if we block the, the inhibitory forces. Uh, this presents a kind of irony. We've talked about the complexity of cancers, the idea that cancers have hundreds or thousands of mutations, but it appears that the likelihood of having a response to these checkpoint inhibitors is enhanced for those patients whose cancers have many, many mutations, suggesting that it may be more likely that those so-called passenger mutations, the coincidental mutations that may not be driving the cancer itself, are making um, proteins that are recognized as novel and responded to by the immune system. So in that case, having lots of mutations is a good thing. And once we know the rules for why the immune system responds to certain proteins and not others, I think we'll have a better way of judging who's going to respond and perhaps to guide that response. The last, last category of, of new things that I wanted to mention uh, is the way in which our understanding of the altered profile of the genome in a cancer cell uh, is changing our perceptions of what we ought to study in thinking about cancer. And I'm not going to go through this list, but there's a long list of, of items, some of which are new and some of which are not new, that require a lot of additional attention. The first on this list is just simple metabolism. And um, Otto Warburg, a chemist uh, who worked uh, about 80 years ago, had noticed that, that cancer cells uh, metabolize sugar in an interesting way, generate a lot of acidic output, uh, and the, me the metabolic pathways of the cell are altered uh, in ways that we now understand frequently reflect changes uh, in uh, the enzymes that, that govern metabolism, opening an opportunity for a fairly wide um, um, means of, uh, of, uh, of interfering with an essential attribute of, of cancer cells. Uh, 
We know that DNA repair is important in cancer cells, and interfering with DNA repair is already uh, of use in, in certain kinds of cancer, such as ovarian cancer. Uh, many other things in this list are of interest. I'm not going to have time to talk about them. I would point out two that uh, are of particular interest to me because they are topics that my new lab at Cornell is focusing on. One involves a process that was so-called RNA splicing that was discovered in part here at Cold Spring Harbor and to the surprise of many uh, mutations that are found commonly in certain kinds of cancer, including lung cancer and certain kinds of leukemia, affect the factors that the cell provides to allow RNA to be spliced. How that makes a cancer, we don't know, but we and many others are working on that. Uh, another topic of great interest to, to my group is how is it determined when in the development of a certain kind of, of normal cell uh, do the mutations uh, actually result in causing cancer. So uh, every cell, as we know, comes from early progenitors. Uh, when in the, the progression of differentiation to make a lung or a kidney or a brain, uh, is the cell susceptible to the mutations that we find in cancers? And that's another topic that my lab is trying to work on. Well, so much for the scientific terrain. I think there's one message here, it's that uh, we have a lot more questions, we know a lot more, we're getting clinical results, all that's pretty exciting. Um, and yet there are some aspects of the sociology and the politics of science that I want to address now that, that um, should give all of us some pause about whether we have created um, a, um, an enterprise that is properly supported, properly constructed to take advantage of all these incredible opportunities for understanding and coping with the disease that we cause, call collectively cancer. Um, first thing I want to mention is how we think about the scientific enterprise in general. Uh, at the end of World War II, after the enormous successes that science had providing radar, treatment for malaria, the atomic bomb, other things that uh, led to our success in that war, um, President Roosevelt had asked, uh, a, the leader of uh, the government's scientific enterprise, Vannevar Bush, to set some guidelines for how the federal government should invest in science. And what Vannevar Bush did was to um, make a division that has been um, uh, accepted and followed for many years. That is the basic notion that, that fundamental discovery is the job of academic laboratories supported by the government and that the practical applications, that is the development of products, the use um, in um, uh, pragmatic circumstances, is largely the job of the private sector. Uh, we think about things a little differently in the world of cancer, not entirely, but uh, um, certainly the world I grew up in starting in 1970 was a world in which um, those of us who were trying to think about the genetics of cancer uh, lived very far apart from people who were taking care of cancer patients and uh, could be considered uh, to be doing clinical oncology. Uh, if I ran into a, a clinician taking care of cancer patients in the bathroom, we really had nothing to say to each other. Uh, different language, different culture, different personnel, different laboratories, everything was separate. Uh, and it was, would have been no different if I had run into a clergyman in the, in the bathroom. Over the ensuing years, um, and I've been telling you about some of these things, particularly starting around 1990 as we began to understand more about cancer genomes and cancer genes, uh, the two spheres began to overlap. And for some of the reasons that I've explained to you already, um, language became at least part in part in common, and we spent more time with each other. And since around 2005, 2010, these worlds have become much more overlapping. Uh, and at this point, large segments of the things that clinicians do, assess cancer risk, make the diagnosis, uh, think about treatment and prevention, increasingly is dependent on, on, uh, on, these, um, on, on the way in which uh, we work with each other. So this affects the way the whole organization is structured, how cancer centers are, are, uh, are working, uh, how uh, the New York Genome Center, for example, which I uh, some, uh, serve part-time, works with the scientific community and with the clinical community. 
Uh, and this is an exciting development that, that reflects a dramatic change between the world I entered in 1970 and the world I live in today. The second point has to do with how we organize ourselves. And when I went to work um, at UC San Francisco, uh, the goal in general was to be successful, build a huge lab. Uh, you might or might not have one or two people you work closely with, but, um, and collaboration was not off the chart, but it was not all that common. But I've had the advantage of spending most of, a large part of my research career uh, in a deep partnership with my friend, uh, Mike Bishop. Uh, there's a picture of us at the Colston Harbor RNA tuber virus meeting, which we happened to run in 1978, uh, and other pictures, uh, uh, including some on our, at our annual softball game, uh, which ended, us, unfortunately, in 1993 when I had to leave San Francisco. Uh, but we also had group activities, teams. Uh, one of them was called the West Coast Tumor Virus Cooperative that involved um, my close colleague Peter Vogt and many others at Berkeley and uh, USC and UCLA, Salk Institute, uh, later the, the Hutchison Center, uh, to get together, much as we would at Cold Spring Harbor, to talk about um, common problems, try to solve things in, um, in, in a common way. Um, and that was a supplement to the kind of team that existed within the Barmas Bishop group shown here in 1985. My wife is on the far right in that picture and in the back row probably huddling uh, today, um, uh, not wanting to be recognized, but uh, maybe some of you will recognize her from that picture. And, um, so this is an important feature of the way we work today. I told you about the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a project that depended entirely on the development of large teams. Uh, there are other teams supported by philanthropy to generate uh, connections between clinicians and, and basic scientists. And that's all a, a terribly exciting thing. But now I have to spend a couple of moments talking about something that's not so heartwarming, and that is funding for science. Um, I entered science, as I mentioned, in 1970. Uh, within a year, President Nixon signed the National Cancer Act, which attracted a lot of attention led to dramatic increases in funding for the National Cancer Institute. Um, I never worried one day about whether I would get funded. Uh, I just assumed that if I did reasonable work and submitted uh, reasonable plans for what I would do in the future, that the money would be there to help support my work. And indeed, it was. Uh, but over the last several years especially, things have gone very sour. And uh, at a time when, when the opportunities, as I've tried to emphasize, are greater than ever. So here is a picture of, of I don't want to belabor this, but uh, from just showing from 1990 to 2014, um, what you can see is a, a, a rapid um, period in the late 90s when the budget shot up. We had a five-year doubling of the NIH budget, but since then there's been tremendous attrition, especially if we adjust for inflation. Uh, with the loss of about over a, um, a quarter of, uh, of the amount that we would have expected from just gradual increases over the course of, of many years. Uh, and in fact, uh, we were back to the levels of funding that we had uh, roughly in 2000, um, and uh, at a time when the number of investigators trying to work in this field have increased has increased dramatically when the number of opportunities for doing exciting research has increased. And that has created uh, a, uh, a number of difficulties that many of which just emanate from the simple observation that the success rate for grant applicants has declined by about the factor of two uh, over the last uh, decade, uh, with uh, success rates for applicants being about um, a quarter to a third uh, in the early days of the, of the, of the century, um, and uh, now, most recent years, 12, 13 percent. That, in other words, one in eight or one in nine of uh, the applications to do research from the NCI have declined. Now, this has created a crisis, a crisis that a group of my colleagues and I have tried to uh, summarize um, in an essay that we published a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, what we said there was that we have a Malthusian dilemma. Too many people chasing too little money at a time of great scientific um, promise. 
and there is a tremendously high level of competition, we call it hyper-competition, for grants from the NIH and other places, for jobs at, at the, our academic health centers, uh, for, um, or for uh, research institutions like this one, uh, for simply slots in the journals that are most highly regarded for uh, reasons that I think are suspect. Uh, we've, um, in, the, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the framework of this hyper-competitive atmosphere, we've distorted our evaluation standards, frequently uh, resorting to depending on editors of those three journals, the CNS stands for Cell, Nature, Science. Uh, these are good journals, but we overvalue publication in them. Uh, and we depend upon acceptance of papers in those journals uh, for our, instead of making a, a separate evaluation on whether uh, someone is simply doing good science and uh, reproducible science and valuable science uh, and, and interesting science. Uh, and all of that has generated a loss of confidence among scientists. They're worried all the time about where their next dollar is going to come from. This depletes leisure time and it really, and it deprives people of the opportunity to feel that they can think in unbridled fashion and not have to worry about meeting certain false standards. Is this work translatable from the lab to the clinic? Is this work going to have some kind of impact? Is, it going to be, is there going to be an outcome that we can measure? And those criteria are false and they create a disrespect and a disregard and a, and, and a uh, and a nervousness about doing things that are simply good fundamental science. And that fundamental science is critical. I've tried to emphasize in, my, in talking about how we learn what we've learned about cancer. We have to study viruses which may or may not have a role in, in human cancer. We have to develop technologies that allow us to move faster. Um, we have good examples of how these things have happened uh, just in the last few years, the, 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 the gene editing technique called CRISPR came from uh, just a curiosity about some strange sequences found in, in, in microorganisms. We wouldn't have been able to take the effective steps we've taken against HIV and AIDS if we hadn't just studied the, the viruses called retroviruses well before uh, they were known to be um, involved in the causation of a disease like AIDS. So these fundamental uh, approaches to, to science are critical and they're threatened in the current environment. So the group that wrote this essay has taken, is trying to take action on many fronts. Uh, I don't have time to review those, but I would refer those of you who are interested to a website we've recently created, rescuingbiomedicalresearch.org, uh, and uh, you'll see what the community is doing to try to confront some of these dilemmas. Prime among the things that worry me, the changes in our demographics, in particular, this one set of figures, which shows that over the last 30 years or so, the number of people uh, and the percentage of folks who are under 36 has declined dramatically uh, from, uh, this, these are d individuals who have uh, the most common form of NIH grant, the so-called R01. Uh, that, that number has declined by about fivefold. Uh, and concomitantly, and perhaps of, of note, given my own age, uh, the number of individuals over the age of, of 66 who, um, are, um, uh, who are obtaining grant support is increased about tenfold. Now, that can be viewed as a good thing, but in the atmosphere in which um, the average age of investigators receiving their first grant is, uh, near, is over the age of 40, this to me is, uh, is something of concern that requires uh, some careful attention. Now, there are lots of ways that we can try to improve this environment that clearly uh, is, uh, is um, uh, creating difficulties in, in, in um, creating an, an atmosphere in which discovery is encouraged. And um, I have a list of things here. I'm not going to have time to review them all in view of the time. Um, but uh, I would point out that Cold Spring Harbor has been particularly effective in, in thinking through um, its, the, the, the nature of the laboratory structure in this, in this environment does not give tenure to the vast majority of people. Uh, it uh, has novel ways to carry out graduate training. Um, it brings in folks from the community, such as yourselves, to, uh, to 
uh, secured greater public support for science, as shown along the bottom, a very important thing in the current environment in which uh, politicians seem much less interested in, con in worrying about one of the bedrocks of our society, namely the, our uh, American um, uh, investment and success in science. I do want to say a word or two about something that's been a common interest of, of mine and people here at Colston Clover, namely how we share information, how we publish it, how we disseminate our findings, um, because this is something that I think still needs further attention. Um, over the last, you know, when, I, when I began doing science, we didn't have an internet, we didn't have a way to go to a website and see uh, a journal or see collections of journal articles. Uh, we struggled to find uh, in a big volume called Index Medicus, some articles that would be relevant to our research. That's all changed thanks to the internet and computer science in general. And um, we now have public libraries like PubMed Central at the NIH that everybody uses every day if you live within an academic institution that, uh, that um, uh, uh, and uh, we have new methods for online so-called open access publishing where the authors and their funding institutions um, supply the, the, the financing to uh, pay for the editing of these journals and, uh, and to allow um, uh, the papers to be made available immediately upon publication. More recently, there's been greater and greater interest in uh, a new kind of adventure that Cold Spring Harbor has been pioneering in, that is uh, developing a way for individuals, even before any peer review of the article, to place the article in the public domain as a preprint, which then acquires reviews or gets submitted later to a publication. Uh, and this is a, a way, in a sense, to open our conclusions, provide our data early on so that uh, we can fulfill the demands and, and the wishes, the aspirations of folks who pay for our science, namely to make that information as available for, um, for uh, examination and further building as soon as possible. And I think we all, uh, I hope we all subscribe to the idea that we as scientists should not be monks hoarding our holy books, but instead uh, building a, 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 an inventory of information that we've generated for public good uh, in public libraries. So what I've tried to tell you in the last hour is how um, the world looked to me 45 years ago, how it looks both similar but mainly different today. Um, cancer is an enormous public health problem, also a scientific conundrum, which has gotten, on the one hand, more understandable because we have a lot of facts, but also more complex than it looked uh, 45 years ago. We have new tools. We have a lot of people. We have diminished resources. And we have a conundrum here. We have to figure out some ways in which to reshape our enterprise so that uh, we can make the best use of the talents, the, the inclination to discovery, and the energy of people who are entering uh, this remarkable field of science. Thanks very much.